countryside of Missouri hasn't changed much since the turn of the century. The corn is still high and the cattle still roam leisurely under the trees. But if you head into town looking for the old saloons and sporting houses where ragtime music was first heard, you'll be disappointed. The fine homes on the other side of the tracks are still there. Inside, ambitious young fingers tried to coax from the keys the syncopations heard from afar, but only when parents were out, and never ever on Sundays. It was here, in the middle of North America, that ragtime began, where mind and body capitulated to rhythms never dreamt of before, and which have never really stopped since. by the way. The history, the whole era, that's what drew me to it in the first place. It wasn't the music. I'm fascinated by the society, the, po the political society, the moral tone, the uh, whole society at the turn of the century is what keeps me fascinated to this. Now, the music, sure, that's marvelous, but the theater, I'm just as interested in the theater. I'm as fascinated by George M. Cohan, let's say, as I am Scott Joplin, and I'm equally interested in Thomas Edison and William Jennings Bryan. Ragtime caused exactly the same kind of furore and fuss as rock and roll. People looked at it not so much as a music, but as a, a way of life and a dance, and it was a lewd one. Here's a quote from a paper called The Musical Courier, which came out in 1899. I don't know the man's name, but he says this about ragtime. A wave of vulgar, filthy, and suggestive music has inundated the land. The pabulum of theater and summer hotel orchestras is hoon music. Nothing but ragtime prevails, and the cakewalk with its obscene posturings, its lewd gestures. It is artistically and morally depressing and should be suppressed by press and pulpit. It's impossible to maintain any degree of depression and play this. And a number of us who are really well-developed manic depressives have tried <laughs> to come to a rehearsal and maintain. It's out of the question. Even after ragtime died out, as far as a popular music in the late teens, uh, people still played ragtime in one form or another. And it might have been called novelty piano or jazz. And it certainly went out of vogue you know, in the 30s, for example. But it never really totally died out. It was absorbed into other music. In the 70s, the dean of ragtime is Max Morath. His one-man show, The Ragtime Years, tours cities and campuses throughout North America. He is actor, singer, pianist, comedian, but above all, historian, all rolled into one persuasive entertainer whose affection for the ragtime age is self-evident.
Thank you very much, Scott Joplin, King of Ragtime. Scott Joplin was not the first King of Ragtime, you know. Three years before Joplin published the famous Maple Leaf Rag in Sedalia, Missouri, six years before The Entertainer was published in St. Louis, a kid by the name of Ben Harney took his ragtime piano from Kentucky into New York and hit the big time. Harney's ragtime was not the cool and classic style of the Missouri greats. It was a raunchy and raucous ragtime with words. This is my version of his first big hit song, Mr. Johnson Turned Me Loose, which by the way, I think is the first song about getting busted. Harney opened it at Keith's Union Square Theater one cold February night in 1896 and thereby began the 20th century four years early. Max denies that he peddles nostalgia. Who, in their right minds, would prefer a tinny upright to a concert grand, or a smoky tavern to a beautiful theater? Let's, for crying out loud, forget nostalgia and look at the facts. That's what Max says. It was the first American music because in my mind, and this is the glory of it, by the way, it was the first coalescence. The Mississippi Valley in America had practically every culture, every nationality, every faith, every musical input that the world had to offer at 1900. And they all got together there and cooked. And a music came out of it, among other things. But it became the first popular music for a completely different set of coincidences. That is, the phonograph was invented. And by 1900 was a big industry. Uh, the United States and Canada were finally all pulled together as far as communications were concerned. For instance, that was the great period, the great flowering of the periodical, the magazine, the mass market magazine and newspaper. And merchandising, before you could have a popular music, you had to have those counters in the five and 10 cent store and in all those little retail stores all over the country that when a piece of music was published in St. Louis on Tuesday, it was on the stands in San Francisco on Friday. And that's what happened. And ragtime happened to be the music that was going and therefore was the first pop with a capital P and quotes around it that happened. Now that's another fascination of it. Forget about the musicological interest, which is there also. Just the social impact that one kind of music swept the country and that somebody in Poughkeepsie, New York was whistling the same tune as a guy in Albuquerque or Saskatchewan. I got a ragtime dog and a ragtime cat, a ragtime piano with my ragtime flat, I'm wearing ragtime clothes from head to shoe. I read a paper called the ragtime news, I got a ragtime habits and I talk that way. I sleep in ragtime and rag all day, I got a ragtime of troubles from my ragtime wife, I'm suddenly living a, a ragtime life, yes. Written in 1900. Oh. Big prayer meeting last Sunday morn. Hymns were in ragtime as sure as you're born. Syncopation is in every song. Clocks and watches are running wrong. Cakewalk music, it fills the air. You can't escape because it's everywhere. First, I didn't want any at all, but now you can stop me. Ian Whitcomb is a one-time British rock star who in the 70s cut his hair settled in Hollywood and concentrated his considerable energies on amassing vast knowledge of Tin Pan Alley. The result was a much praised book called After the Ball and an enthusiasm for performing ragtime which knows no bounds. I'm certainly living a ragtime life. which was the ragtime the general pu the general public knew that was the ragtime that they would hear when they out went out to a vaudeville theater or bought a song but to the aficionado and there were a few then real ragtime classic ragtime was a carefully composed form to be played on a piano on a nice uh, summery afternoon to be played very carefully in the concert style so the Scott Joplin when he wrote rags wasn't really writing them to be danced to uh, he wanted them to be accepted in the same way that classical music was accepted.
Richard Zimmerman is a leading member of the ragtime fraternity. Though he's recorded the complete piano works of Scott Joplin, in concerts he frequently champions little known rags, such as this one, The Meadowlark, by Thomas Pitts. Emphasize those weak beats of the measure. Uh, instead of and you have melody coming in between those normally accented beats of the measure. And what the end result is, it gives sort of a choppy, ragged effect to it. And in ragtime, the left hand plays this kind of a march bass, while the right hand plays the melody, which is choppy or syncopated. So you get that ragged effect. Now, that wasn't new in ragtime. It had been used in uh, European music sparingly by classical composers. And of course, you find it uh, used throughout a lot of the African rhythms. But uh, when this syncopation was combined with the European music, you know, the, the uh, German march form and uh, quadrilles and dances and all of the music that was sort of bubbling around America in the 1800s, uh, you found that there was created, after it finally got through evolving, a music which became known as ragtime, which had the syncopation super, superimposed over this European uh, form. <laughs> things happening to ragtime today is the transcription of what is basically a piano style to other sounds and other instruments. This is Nexus, a name coined for themselves by a group of virtuoso Toronto percussionists. kind of flabby, generic definition, marks the entry of the common man into music. It's really true. You know, for centuries in Western civilization, music belonged to the elite. And if you were a common man, a poor man, if you had any music in your life, it was in your church, and maybe a primitive instrument of some kind that you plunked away on. But uh, you didn't really have uh, music that you could create and have a market for and sell and entertain with. So along comes ragtime, not just for musical reasons, but social and economic reasons. And here's a climate that brings people who had never been able to market their talents before into the music and entertainment business. And so you had all kinds of things such as style in vocals come in with ragtime. I had your picture near my heart all the way to Kentucky. Had it on the train when I landed in Maine. Kept it on my knee all the way to Virginia. True Blue Sam, that traveling man. When I got off to Illinois, I met a bunch of traveling boys. A honey lamb, a honey lamb, just a 
prove to you how true I am. I got them all around and I took out your picture. They looked at you, then they looked at me. They all gave me the laugh. Cause everybody had your photograph. Another good gal's gone wrong. Terry Waldo is a far cry from straw hats and sleeve garters. In the age of the amplifier, he sometimes had to play his ragtime piano very loudly to be heard at all. But he remains very much a man of his own time and a super salesman for ragtime because of it. Ragtime is America's first contribution to the world's great music, and it's a combination of European and African music. And it takes the harmonies and that sort of structure from, from Europe, when it's written down especially. But it's got the rhythm of African music, the drums, the subtle accents, and all that sort of thing. And incidentally, I think that's maybe being lost. You know, most of the people who play ragtime are coming out of Juilliard now, and the conservatories, and have a classical background. That was not true in 1900. And the styles have changed throughout, pretty much by decades even. You can say it was connected with jazz at one time. At other times, it was, you know, it's connected with the classics now. At that time, it was connected with the, um, oh, how should, what do we say, the whorehouses, I suppose. And I kind of like to get it back where it started, actually. And out of the concert hall, if we could. You don't like to hear ragtime in the concert hall? I think it's stifling sometimes. I do it, and I'll play with symphonies often. But the thing that's lost in a concert hall, I think, is bodily movement. Because this stuff was connected with dance music at one time. And it was alive and exciting and sexual, actually. And I think in a concert hall, we tend to try to stifle that. I was playing for some kids, uh, I guess it was yesterday, elementary school. And they're trying to get them indoctrinated into the concert hall kind of thing. So they don't want them to applaud and they don't want them to stamp their feet and all that kind of thing. And they want them to sit there very rigidly. And I think ragtime loses something. Next is one of Scott Joplin's compositions that started the popularity of ragtime to begin with years ago. This one features piano by P. Clute. It's called the Maple Leaf Rag. At Earthquake Magoons in San Francisco, Turk Murphy's band makes music to which it's impossible to sit still. Turk's partner is pianist Pete Clute, who specializes in the old rags. Now, some may say that what you hear in Magoons isn't pure ragtime. But if Scott Joplin could hear Turk's trombone, he probably wouldn't mind a bit.
There's no question about the fact that Scott Joplin's music has finally now been articulated, it's been published, it's been recorded. There are two complete works of Joplin in records, very fine records. Uh, the establishment, so to speak, has incorporated Scott Joplin's music in the American pianist's repertory. Fine. That's the way it should be. It should have happened years ago. It does not, in my mind, follow that that is a ragtime revival. As I said before, for something to be revived in the pop form means for it to become current, for it to become contemporary, for there to be a lot of young, talented players eager to go out and get those jobs and bring the music to the public and put their own imprint on it. And that's not happening. Now, there has happened this, and I should hasten to add this. There have been a number of young and contemporary pianists, composers, who have taken the classic ragtime piano form and found a great deal of joy and creative uh, input into working inside of it, writing new rags in the classic form. And that's a time-honored thing in music and, and in the arts, in literature, do you find an old form like the sonnet, let's say, and you decide that you will write within it, and it imposes a very strict discipline on you. I think that's one reason people like the classic rag form. Now, we're talking about ragtime in the classic piano sense only that it says to you, all right, if you're going to write in my form, you have to write in 2-4 time with 16 measure phrases, certain uh, uh, harmonic devices. Uh, you cannot uh, go into atonality. And you accept all those disciplines and limits, and then you write. And that is happening. The contemporary composer who finds pleasure in writing within the form is Ben McPeak of Toronto. He recently wrote this piece for the Canadian harpist Erica Goodman. How did they sound? How early? Can you well say uh, the first written, first written rag? Say Mississippi. Well, Mississippi rag, Dave Jason correctly points out, is really technically not a rag, but a cakewalk. It's right. more of a cakewalk. But uh, Harlem rag by Tom Turpin of St. Louis uh, came out sounding very much like this. <laughs> sounds very much like a march and that came out in 1897 on the other hand when you listen to UB Blake play Charleston rag that he wrote in 1899 uh, still it sounds vastly different as does uh, the dream which he learned from Jesse Pickett which sounds different still it sounds very Spanish and that dates from the 1880s so there was no one sound to this music at that time <laughs> Years ago, if uh, 
The, the note was dotted, and it had a dash over the top of it, and it said, uh, Allegro or Marato, you'd play it that way. We didn't play that way. Beethoven says, do this. Beethoven, these guys don't know nothing about Beethoven. People say to me, you be, I heard Joe Blow play Home Sweet Home, but when you play it, it sounds different. Now, I don't play no better than, I ain't no slouch now. You can't just, <laughs> you can't just run over top. started mainly as a, mu as a music played by black people and as you go around the country today and the few people that are playing ragtime a lot uh, apart from one singular exception of Ubi Blake are white. Now uh, well, why is this? Oh I think it's very logical. Uh, the ragtime years are roughly from the period 1895 to 1920. It was a lousy time to be a black in the United States of America. Not that there's been any other time that was much better. But I can't imagine any reason why a, a young black musician today would be the least bit interested in the past. It doesn't have a fascination. It probably has, if anything, a dread. U.B. Blake being the exception is only because he was there. There was just not too many respectable places that a black musician could get a job playing this kind of music, uh, which had a syncopation, this feel to it. Back at that time, from what I've been able to find out, the black musicians who were interested in classical music and wanted to pursue a career in, let's say, concert work, had the doors pretty much closed to them. There was a very narrow range of musical outlets for blacks at that time. musicians, I want you to know the keys that I was playing. G flat and B major, five sharps. I don't know how to write them in those keys. When did you first hear that rag, you the last one? When did I do it? When, when did you hear it first? I was around 13. Now, you do the mathematics. I'm, at, I'm 93 now. Now, you, you do the mathematics. Yeah. You be, are you playing that, to the best of your knowledge, about as close to the way that Jesse Pickett taught it to you? That's just the way Jesse taught it to me. Ubi Blake is, is the only man alive today who was there when ragtime was being created. I mean, he helped create it. He knew Scott Joplin. I hear that he taught James B. Johnson to play. I mean, he's, he is the most important, authentic figure around today. It'd be rather like Moses still being alive um, if one was researching the Bible. And I'm just wild about Harry And Harry's wild about Cannot do without Harris is wild about me. Yubi Blake's ragtime piano has a different sound from the classic Missouri style. This is Eastern ragtime, sometimes known as stride piano, an aggressive, pungent way of playing, suiting the big cities where it was nurtured. modern exponent of this tradition is Dick Hyman, a regular of the cookery, the famous jazz joint in New York's Greenwich Village.
before 1950, ragtime music, if it was thought of at all, was thought of as pure corn. But in that year, They All Played Ragtime was published. It was a marvellous book, co-authored by Harriet Janis and Rudy Blesch. And with it, ragtime was on the road to respectability. Rudy Blesch is the senior figure in today's ragtime fraternity, and he is as fascinated as ever by the music he helped rediscover. He explained the difference between Missouri and Eastern ragtime. Well, I think it's a question of the type of folk music that it comes from. In the first place, um, there is a bucolic or a rural feeling to the Midwestern ragtime, which comes from the area in which it sprang, sprang up. Um, it comes from both uh, uh, Negro folk singing and, and white folk song. It's a mixture of the two. Whereas in the East, um, while it still is a form of ragtime, it came mainly from the church singing of the Negroes. That's why um, uh, some of the numbers, instead of being called rags, are called shouts. Because in church, you, you shout. The, the music, for example, of um, James P. Johnson is called Carolina Shout. Well, by that, he meant the shouting that goes on with the congregation in the church. So you have a different source and uh, it comes through in the spirit of the music itself. Johnson's Carolina Shout is played here by Dick Wellstead, who can probably play more notes accurately within a specified time than anyone else alive. He makes piano playing look so easy, no rhythm sections needed here. You know, it's been 32 years ago this year that, I've, that I first heard James P. Johnson down the street. Yeah. When I came to New York when I was a kid, uh, when I was 18, which was 1944, and he was playing with Willie the Lion Smith down the street here at a place called the Pied Piper. And I heard him from then till about 1949. You know, he'd been sick and he had a stroke and so on. I don't think he played much after that in public, after 1949. But he was around New York. Quite a, you know, quite often, and played intermission at Eddie Condon's and so on. It really wasn't an archaeological trip to go hear those guys in those days, because they were all still around, a lot of them, like the Lion and James P. and the Beatle and Donald Lambert and so on and so on, Lucky Roberts and a bunch of them. Terrific. The stride piano, what, uh, to the uninitiated, what, what, what's, what's stride piano, Dick? I, a stride piano is, is really the way that the black piano players used to play in, around the East Coast in the 20s and, or the teens, you know, really is what it is. The best known of them would have been Fats Waller. And for some reason, there are no more black ones doing it. I don't know why. I mean, there's lots of stride piano players of all white. Now, what happened to the black ones? I don't know. It must take a long time to get the left hand going as fast as yours goes usually. Well, in my case, I started doing that really before I did anything else, except maybe some boogie-woogie. And so, sort of like learning to, to run a typewriter, you know, I don't see how people type. 
but I was I've been able been able to do this, you know. Time-honoured uh, question, Mr. Blesh. What, is, what to you is the difference between ragtime and jazz? Between ragtime and jazz? Well, you have to specify the type of jazz that you mean. Early jazz, that is Dixieland jazz, which is based upon a 2-4 beat, was an attempt of improvising musicians, and a successful one in its way, to create orchestral ragtime in New Orleans in the, at the turn of the century. In other words, without piano, in the form of marching bands, but it was definitely based upon the idea of playing rags, which they did, and um, making an instrumental ragtime. Now that's in a one, two, one, two, one, two rhythm. When you get into the uh, 1920s, uh, you can feel the change, for example, in the work of a pianist like uh, Jelly Roll Morton, when he um, gives an example how the Missourians played the Maple Leaf Rag and how he played it, uh, he makes it from from ragtime into jazz because he puts it into a four beat format. Unaccented four four. One, two, three, four, instead of one, two, one, two, one, two. And there there you get a change uh, where I think it definitely leaves the ragtime orbit and becomes more what we would call jazz. And that's definitely the case then when you get into swing and the bands become big that it has gone out of the ragtime orbit. And there again, you have to make exceptions because a, a play, because a because a band leader like Bob Crosby comes along and deliberately creates big band ragtime.
was the countryside and the small towns of Missouri that nurtured ragtime, but the big cities inevitably took over as the 20th century got underway. The St. Louis World Fair of 1904 attracted musicians from all over Middle America, Scott Joplin among them. And the shores of the Mississippi rang with familiar rhythms from dusk till dawn. In the 1970s they still do, but a little sadly perhaps, as in a museum. I think ragtime is a thing of the past and is outmoded and marks a certain period of time in the American past. And to put it another way, if it should be revived and become contemporary again, there would be something wrong with that. I think each form of popular music is almost like a form of fashion, like hairstyles and skirt length and slang, and it passes and it should pass. But now, of course, it, you can amend that and say, well, ragtime evolved into the next stage and these labels change and popular music keeps changing labels and evolves rather than being in little compartments. And therefore, in that sense of the word, ragtime, which was our first popular music, is still with us. Certainly it is at the Los Angeles Music Center before a large concert or opera performance. This is the Majestic Dance Orchestra, a wonderfully inflated title for three carefree but dedicated young musicians. They're dedicated to ragtime, and they work hard at it to reach the standard. waiting for the opera, it's a happy aperitif. And two bits and a hat is a lot cheaper than the culture to come. began as a duo and it began at the beginning of the summer when we moved into this place and we were broke and we went out yeah. to uh, the Century City Shopping Plaza one day and played and I made, uh, made eight bucks a piece That's and we, right. I, you know, we were, it was dog heaven. I mean, we... <laughs> the music has been very affectionately rediscovered by a certain portion of the population. It has had one or two little bursts of extravagant popularity for reasons that have nothing to do with the music, such as the use in a film soundtrack. But the music is not popular in the sense of popular music's overriding national popularity. Uh, there are no great pop rag stars. There are none. Lou Bush, a top recording man in Los Angeles, came close to stardom. He was better known to the general public as Joe Fingers Carr. In the 70s, he still plays up a storm. Joe 
Peter's car was born uh, April 14th, 1950, in, in an office, in my office at Capitol Records, where I was a producer at the time, and he was a figment of my imagination. The first uh, record I made, which was Sam's Song, and a thing called Ivory Rag that I wrote, and it came out, and it was a big hit, uh, big uh, to that extent, and then I started making albums, but uh, if the first record had not sold, we would, Joe Finger's car would have died of mourning, as we say. I think I made, in a period of about 10 years, till about 1960, about 25 albums, I think, and a great many singles, too, which would, did not appear in uh, any of the albums. I don't think the music changes, but the people change. As um, Virginia Woolf said about pictures, speaking of modern art, he says, pictures don't change, people change. And in other words, um, once it's established as a definite repertory, a certain type of composition with, uh, with known composers, it could languish on the shelf unplayed for 200 years, just, just as Johann Sebastian Bach did. Bach was rediscovered in the middle of the 19th century by men like, by men like Mendelssohn. He was virtually unknown. Well, would you say that Bach hadn't been viable during all that time? It's an agreeable sign of the times that it no longer seems wrong to program Scott Joplin next to John Sebastian Bach. At an informal concert at the Banff Springs Hotel, the Canadian Brass did just that. We're going to turn from the music of Uncle Bach now and, and move to the the century changed around 1900 when composers started really becoming interested in brass instruments, particularly the, the trombone, which very seldom used in classical music before that time, not counting Uncle Bach, of course. And Scott Joplin, who to us looks like a, a cornet player in a, in a town band, typical town band, as well as a pianist, wrote some very, very interesting ragtimes that in fact show how pretty the trombone can really play. Thousands of rags were published in the ragtime years. What proportion of those are worth remembering? Oh, about 0.007%. I really believe that, you know. I think this is another thing about popular music. We make a great mistake if we try to keep looking for, for musical comparisons. 
popular music is, again, a manifestation of fashion. It should be ephemeral. Most of it should pass with the years. And as the years go by, those really talented composers and performers come up through and join the repertory. This is happening with our musical theater now. We're finally beginning to do Jerome Kern and Cole Porter and the early uh, Richard Rogers. We're doing it in repertory as the Viennese do the Strauss things. I mean, it's not nostalgic, it's not uh, an excuse, it's our culture. And this is what Scott Joplin has brought us and this is what Irving Berlin has brought us. Ruth Johnson leads the band. It is a ragtime band down in Savannah. I said Savannah. They paint the ragtime melodies, those hunky dory harmonies down in Savannah, GA. Why those cows and sheep, they clap of their feet when they start into play. Here they come, just listen to that drum. Oh man, he's playing some. He's going. Listen to that dog on flute. Hey man, ain't that trombone moaning? Listen to that hot cornet played by the leader. Man, so grand. They got a worldwide reputation for playing syncopation. Oh. Johnson's harmony band Go now, written by Shelton Brooks Here they come Just listen to that drum Oh man, he's playing soon He's going Listen to that dog on flute <clears throat> Oh man, hear that trombone moaning Listen to Some bank! 